Welcome to this second part of 10th week. We will not be studying optics in detail because optics in itself is a vast subject. So instead what we are going to do is to simply confine ourselves to few simple things which we need so that we can understand how waves and oscillations as a phenomena work in optical system. To begin with let me remind you of Fermat's principle. So the principle simply states that the actual path taken by the light is the one for which the optical path is an extremum. In the standard simple case of a homogeneous medium and a light traveling from point A to point B, it is equivalent to saying in a sense that light takes the pa shortest path between those two points. In this case, it, it would be a straight line. Fermat's principle can be stated as the actual path between any two points is the one for which the optical path is stationary with respect to variations in the path. Today we will apply Fermat's principle to a little more complicated system, mainly to the case of a thin lens. I am going to start with the case of plano convex lens. So the lens is plane on one side and has a convex face on the other side. So this distance here would define for me the thickness of the lens. All you need is a circle of which this convex arc is a part and the radius of that circle which I have denoted by capital R is the radius of curvature of this lens. Whenever this d which is the thickness of lens is much smaller than the radius of curvature then you call it thin lens. I am going to assume that a plane wave comes from the left side which will be our convention to assume this pretty much in most of the problems that there is an incident plane wave coming from the left side. And I am also going to assume that the medium of this plano convex lens has a refractive index mu. And in general you can assume that the refractive index of the medium outside of this lens is equal to 1. Now let us focus on a ray which would be at a distance r from the optical axis. So the optical axis here in this case is indicated by this uh, red line. The origin of y axis coincides with this red line. So this small r would define for me some arbitrary distance from the optical axis. What happens to this incoming incident plane wave after it passes through this plano convex lens? So if you are along the optic axis along this red line, the ray which comes along this red line would travel an entire distance d inside the lens as you can see. On the other hand, the ray which is hitting the lens at a distant r from this red line would only travel part of the distance inside the lens. There is this one part which would be traversed inside the lens and there is the other part which would be traveled outside the lens. So let us call this time d, the time taken for the wave front to travel this distance d inside the lens along the optic axis or the central axis and that time would be given by mu times d divided by c, c is the velocity of light, d is of course the thickness of lens and mu is the refractive index of the medium of lens. Now what happens to the wavefront that hits the lens at a distance r from this axis? So what we want to know is how much distance does the wavefront travel in the same time t. You can take a look at this uh, diagram, it is nearly the same diagram that I have here but I have tried to focus on this particular ray which comes and hits the lens at a distance r from the optic axis. Now from the geometry of this figure you can use Pythagoras theorem to write the following equation 
r minus x whole square plus small r square is equal to r square. So, that is the solution for x. It cannot be a value that is larger than r. If I keep the plus sign in the solution, it would tell me that x will have a value that is larger than r. Hence, I will take x to be r minus square root of r square minus r square. Now, we make the binomial approximation. So, the binomial approximation is of the following type. So, if I have a function of this type, 1 plus x to the power half or in general I could consider 1 plus or minus x to the power half. This will approximately be equal to 1 plus or minus half into x. It is actually an infinite series which we are terminating at this point and this approximation would work only if x is much smaller than 1. This is the result that we want. So, the distance traversed by the wavefront at a distance r from the axis inside the lens that is very important. So, this is the distance travelled by the wavefront, but inside the lens it is given by d minus r square by 2 r. In addition to this it also travels a certain distance outside the lens. If we indicate this distance by is it? So, the distance traversed by wavefront outside the lens would be given by r square by 2 r plus some z. So, here I have essentially equated the times on the left hand side is the time taken to traverse the distance d along the haptic axis and on the right hand side here is the time taken to traverse some distance in the same time. This is going to give me, so if you remember z is simply some arbitrary point up till which our ray has travelled in time t. Value of z depends on r, depends on how far you are from the optic axis and also it depends quadratically on r. Now, I can go back and uh, draw a figure here to indicate this. Let me show that in blue. So, it is going to look something like this. What does this tell us? It tells us that all the points which make the wavefront, they are at a distant z from this line that I have here. And the locus of all these points has this r square dependence. So, you could say that in three dimensions, the locus of z is going to define for us a sphere whose uh, radius is going to be r by mu minus 1. This also means that there is going to be a point of convergence at the center of that sphere. So, in other words if I had an object which is placed at infinity and there is an incoming wavefront which you have assumed to be a plane wave, it is hitting this plano convex lens. What this analysis tells us is that all the rays would converge at uh, this point whose radius is given by r divided by mu minus 1. So, power in this case would simply be mu minus 1 by r, which is equal to 1 by the focal length. So, this gives us an estimate of power of a lens, which is its ability to bend the incoming beam of light. Now, we will redo a similar problem, but slightly differently, explicitly using Fermat's principle. So, it is not a lens, what I have is a surface, a refracting surface. So, the surface itself is given by this S p m and we have an object let us say at position uh, O here and q is any point such that O p q together
together form a straight line. Of course, given that O is the some object or some position, where would this be imaged after refraction on the other side of this curved surface? Capital R is the radius of curvature of this curved surface. Now, let us start by looking at this triangle S O C using the cosine law of triangles. I can write the following equation for O S. You can use cosine law of triangles and write this equation. Before I do anything with this expression, I should point out that we will be working in the regime where theta is small. So, this is an approximation in which we will work with and this sort of approximation where the rays are close to the optic axis is called paraxial approximation in optics. So, now I can write O s as follows. Now, this expression can be simplified. I am once again going to use a binomial approximation here. We have an expression for O s now and you can do a very similar calculation to find out S q. So, I will not do that and directly write the result, but it is fairly straightforward. Just follow the recipe that we just adopted. So, I have O s and S q. The total optical path length would be, so the path length O s as you can see happens in a medium where the refractive index is mu 1 and the path length S q takes place in a medium where refractive index is mu 2. Now, I have collected all the terms together, added them and this is my expression for optical path length L. So, I want to find out now d L by d theta and set it equal to 0. R is the radius of curvature capital R. So, it is not equal to 0. So, what could be 0 are only these two things. One is it is possible that theta could be 0 or this entire expression within the square brackets that could be 0. So, theta equal to 0 gives me a straight line path and there is only one possible uh, straight line path. Now, the other way by which d L by d theta can be 0 is when this quantity within the square brackets is 0. This is what we have uh, obtained from the condition that d L by d theta should be equal to 0. If I designate this p i to be some y 0 or the distance of the image from the point p. In that case, all that this equation tells me is that many possible paths are allowed. So, the point here is that any path of type y s i is allowed provided of course, I identify y with y 0 the distance of the image. So, typically these kind of equations follow some convention. For instance, if you go back to this figure that we have here, the distances to the left of p generally take a negative sign and the distances on the right of p, point p would take a positive sign. So, if I actually apply this convention here, this equation could be rewritten as, once again you might recollect that this is simply equal to the power uh, of the lens. So, now I have redrawn the figure slightly differently, so that we can obtain the same result using Snell's law of reflection. So, there is a beam that goes from point O to S and gets refracted and possibly converges at point I. There are various angles defined alpha 1, alpha 2, beta and there is also this perpendicular which is of height h 1. So, what is of interest for us are these three distances x which is the distance from point p to o and the distance from p to i which is called y and then there is radius of curvature which is p c in this diagram. At the refracting point, I should be able to write an equation of this type. 
this is simply a statement of law of refraction. I am going to assume that phi 1 and phi 2 are small in which case, so this is what is called the paraxial approximation. So, this line which goes from C to S is the normal at normal to the curved surface at the point S. Hence, this would be our phi 1 and similarly this would be my phi 2. So, if I look at this triangle OSC, the sum of the angles of this triangle should be 180 degrees. This equation would simplify to the following phi 1 is equal to alpha 1 plus beta. Now, let us also look at the triangle SCI, sum of all the three angles is 180 degrees. This would give me an expression for phi 2 which would be beta minus alpha 2. Remind yourself that we are looking at an approximation where all these angles are very small in which case the sin phi 1 can be approximately written as tan alpha 1 plus tan beta. So, I just expand sin a plus b and consistently apply that all the angles are small enough and then every time you have a sin of theta you can replace it by tan of theta. Again remember that we are working in small angle approximation in which case this distance p d is so small that we can ignore that distance and take this distance o and d to be distance o d to be x itself. So, taking p d small would correspond to again thin lens approximation p and d are so close that we can ignore that small difference and take the distance between p and c to be r itself. Now, by the same token I can write expressions for sin phi 2 as well that would be tan beta minus tan alpha 1. Now, I have expressions for sin phi 1 and sin phi 2 I simply need to substitute in this equation. This is the expression that I get when I substitute it back in this equation which is the law of refraction. Now, by simply rearrange this equation I can write it in a more uh, suggestive form. So, this is the final result I get, but again to put it in a form that is useful for us let us call this distance u to be x, but remember that any distance which is to the left of p is going to get a negative sign. So, u will be minus x and v will be y. So, this is exactly the result that we just got earlier on. So, we got it by two different methods one is by actually applying the Fermat's principle and other by using the law of refraction. It should not be surprising simply because the law of refraction itself was obtained by using Fermat's principle. So, it looks like everything is consistent for us and the quantity here on the right hand side mu 2 minus mu 1 divided by r is again simply equal to the power or p which is the power of lens. You have light beam going from one medium to another medium characterized by refractive indices mu 1 and mu 2. So, we have mu 2 minus mu 1 in the denominator and instead of mu minus 1 that we had earlier on. Now, in the next lecture we will try and put together all these results to obtain uh, equation for thin lens. Mm -hmm.